one word about the Trust for Public Land to start off with. You're wondering, like, <clears throat> what does the Trust for Public Land have to do with any of this? The answer is a lot, and I'll tell you more about that later. But that's my job for the last seven and a half years. So I left the New York City Parks Department seven and a half years ago and have been working at the Trust for Public Land. It's a national nonprofit based, headquartered in San Francisco, but with 30 offices around the country, including a very vigorous office here in New York, which you'll see toward the end. So this is a map that shows New York City parks. Um, it also includes some pieces of federal parks and state parks in New York City. But the amazing thing about New York City and the thing that most out-of-towners out of don't know because they come to New York and they see Times Square is that 21% of New York City is mapped parkland, city, state, or federal parkland. Isn't that extraordinary? And when you add up the acres, it's 45,000 acres of city, state, and federal parkland. You know, roughly 30,000 acres city, about 15,000 um, federal, and you know, roughly 1,000 a, a or 2,000 state. Um, so it's really quite extraordinary. <coughs> but as you can see, all that green is, um, you know, there's some very large pieces of green, and then there's some lots and lots and lots of very small dots, <coughs> which <coughs> adds to the fact that uh, in New York City, you're never, for 97% of us, you're never more than a 10 minute walk away from a park. It could be a very, very small park. It could be a little sitting area. It could be a vast wetland, but you are within a 10 minute walk of the park for, for most of New York. <coughs> um, this is just a quick um, thing about, this is another map way of looking at New York City. This, these are TPL playground projects, the Trust for Public Land playground projects, where we've converted, who grew up in New York, in New York City and went to New York City Public School? Raise a hand. Okay, not a lot. So that thing in the top right hand picture is what they call a, euphemistically, a schoolyard. I call it a prison yard. It's a large sheet of asphalt, impermeable, hot, dangerous asphalt, surrounded by a tall fence. <clears throat> and I don't know whether it's to keep the kids in or keep other people out, but it's, it's not a very salubrious environment. And the bottom picture is what happens, what a, a schoolyard looks like when the Trust for Public Land gets done with it. And it's a big, beautiful new schoolyard and playground for the kids, but it's also a community playground, and it captures stormwater runoff. So going back in time, we're going to step back in time to the 1850s. Um, somebody who didn't work for the Parks Department identified the two men on the top left and bottom right. Uh, Frederick Wall Spencer. Yes, and? Calvert Vox. Calvert Vox. Excellent. We have an erudite audience here. Yes, those are the um, fathers, if you will. There were some others, but those are the principal fathers of Central Park. And really, you could argue that Olmsted and Vox give rise to the great, what some people say is the great American work of art. That Central Park was the 19th century. You know, we had great paintings and great sculptors, but so did Europe. What nobody had was a great public park. <coughs> and the, the evolution of the great American public park starts in the 1850s with the planning for Central Park. I could talk to you literally for three hours about how Central Park got planned, but I won't. <laughs> That'll be another talk. <coughs> Let's just say it's a great story and you should learn about it. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's one, the first great era of park creation is in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and 80s when, um, I'm going to go back one slide just for a second, not just Central Park, but what else gets started? Prospect, Prospect Park. Park. And Julian? Uh, Fort, Green. Fort Green Park. And Van uh, later, Van but by Olmsted and Vox also did Riverside Park. Morningside, Morningside Park. Park, yes. And two parkways. <coughs> and? Ocean, excellent, oh man. You got riggers in the audience, yeah. So <coughs> for, this is the, the final trivia question I promised tonight. <laughs> there is one city in the United States that has as many Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted or Olmsted Brothers Parks as New York City has. That is about eight. So there were eight parks designed by Frederick Law Olmsted <coughs> or his son and, and nephew um, in the Olmsted Brothers firm, which in New York City, that was Fort Tryon Park. There are eight in New York City. There's another city in the United States that also has eight parks designed by somebody named Olmsted. Dun, dun, dun. No, no good guesses. Boston. Boston. Boston is a very good guess because a number of parks were done. <coughs> Buffalo is an excellent guess. The entire Buffalo Olmsted Park system. So Buffalo could be a good guess. Louisville, Kentucky. 
Louisville, Kentucky has a Olmstead Parks. Isn't that extraordinary? They have some fantastic parks. Anyway, I know this now because I, I used to only travel for the Bronx to Staten Island. <laughs> the, the next great period of park creation expansion is the 1930s and the WPA. Um, in the depths of the Great Depression, the, very, the parks that we count on most, the swimming pools, the beaches, were all built in three years. Extraordinary. What they did in the, the first year, they did Central Park Zoo, the Prospect Park Zoo. Riverside Park was done in three years. They're, they're at West Side Highway, e extraordinary stuff. Uh, here you see just a few of the many huge projects of the WPA under the leadership of Robert Moses. Uh, Robert Moses is vilified these days. The things he did for parks were unaccountably good, just extraordinarily good things with the very best architects of the day, building palaces for working people, and that's what these things were. Um, and then um, various other epochs of park creation, but what the next era we really talk about is the era of the sort of the dissolution of the park system. So from the late 1950s through the late 1970s, there was a long, slow, but precipitous decline of the park system. This is a three, um, these headlines are from a three articles investigative series by the New York Times in I think October of 1980. You can find them you know, on the Times machine. And look at that headline, New York City Park System Stands as a Tattered Remnant of Its Past. And that was not an exaggeration. The park system I knew as a teenager and child was a, an utter disaster, including places like Central Park and Prospect Park. So if a flagship parks were like that, you can imagine what the non-flagship parks were like. And these are pictures from those days, and that was the park system I knew as a teenager. It was really hard in the late 1970s to picture a rosy future for New York City. People, the city itself was falling apart. People were moving, had these late night commercials, like get out of this dangerous city and move to New Mexico. <laughs> Rio Rancho, which is now abandoned, just, I'm just saying. Um, one of the very first acts of civic reconstruction was not actually Central Park, was in the Bronx River, where neighborhood activists, the early environmental justice activists said, you know, we're tired of our river being an open sewer. And they started literally hauling debris and garbage out of the Bronx River, which later led to a lot more things, including the creation of the Bronx River Alliance, one of the very powerful partnerships between city government and local environmental justice groups. And so the Bronx River then and the Bronx River now, really quite an extraordinary transformation. And unlike, say, Central Park or Prospect Park, which had wealthy neighbors around them who could contribute lots of private funds, this river was running and still does run through the poorest congressional district in the country. So they had to do this without, there was some private money raised, but uh, lots and lots of public dollars particularly in the days when there was such thing as <coughs> what they call dismissively pork. That is, con Congress members and senators allowed to bring money back to local projects. So a lot of federal money went into restoring the Bronx River <coughs> under the aegis of the Bronx River Alliance, which is an alliance of environmental justice groups from the Bronx, from the South Bronx and Hunts Point, working together with the city. Um, similar transformation happened in Riverside Park Great picture, top left, feast your eyes on that. That's amazing. I found that picture and um, what it shows is in the old days, the first part of Riverside Park designed by Olmsted and Vox was just this narrow little ribbon along Riverside Drive. And then it ended at the railroad tracks and the railroad tracks defined the edge of the river and you couldn't get to the river because there were railroad tracks. So in between 1934 and 1937, Robert Moses and WPA build a giant concrete box, which you can see here. See that? <coughs> giant concrete boxes built over the railroad tracks. And on top of that box, they put Riverside Park. Have any of you been to Riverside Park? You know the, where the gardens are from You've Got Mail? That's on top of railroad tracks. <coughs> That's that box. Isn't that amazing? They did that in three years. It was like giant projects done. In those days, they didn't have community boards to say, we don't want this project. Um, <laughs> They didn't have environmental impact statements. They didn't have the EPA. <laughs> there was nothing standing in their way of like, we're just gonna build in this river, um, which they did. And then that picture in the top right is what Riverside Park looked like about 30 years ago. And then the bottom pictures are what, what it looks like today. Again, a, a great series of public-private partnerships. Prospect Park, another great park. 
some pictures from its not so great past. That's the old tea house, which is still there, of course, beautifully restored now. When one of the occasions when it was set on fire and burned, which was the fate of a lot of parks buildings when the parks were abandoned, they just people just set fire to buildings. Um, and of course, Prospect Park has been a tremendous success. Of all the many projects, um, none speaks to it more than I think than the um, the Lakeside Center, which is a combination of spray spray water feature and two skating rinks where $70 million in public and private money was invested to create this sort of spectacular recreational resource. But my favorite thing about the restoration of Prospect Park is the, the naturalistic landscapes. The, um, the woodlands and the ravines, the long meadow, and all of these spectacular landscapes are beautifully restored. Central Park, you could say, was, we often refer to Central Park and the Central Park Conservancy as the mother of all conservancies, because nothing like that had ever been done before at that scale. This is the Central Park we know and love. That was not the Central Park I grew up with. The creation of the restoration of Central Park was guided by the Central Park Conservancy, and it's the sort of perfect model of a public-private partnership, what people refer to as the PPP. And there you see the public with the Commissioner of Parks and um, Parks Department, the private, the Board of Trustees of Central Park, coming together in this partnership where there's an administrator of the park who reports to the board and to the parks commissioner. And this had never been done before. It was um, somewhat radical at the time, but I want to give a big shout out to the people who made it happen, particularly Betsy Barlow Rogers, the first administrator of the park and the founder of the Conservancy. Gordon Davis, who was the parks commissioner at the time, a brilliant, innovative parks commissioner, way more innovative than me, <coughs> and um, Ed Koch. Ed Koch, who helped bring back the parks in New York City and, and was very open to all kinds of sort of novel ideas. Um, who here is old enough to remember the sheep meadow looking like that? You, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. Um, that, was this, that was the sheep meadow I used to go play touch football on as a teenager like that. And not so much a meadow, kind of like hard packed dirt with a lot of broken glass and um, dog poop <coughs> and all kinds of terrible stuff. So that's what you, that was the sheep meadow in the 1970s. <coughs> and then uh, Ed Koch becomes mayor, Gordon Davis becomes commissioner, Betsy Barlow is appointed administrator of Central Park. And the very first thing they do is come up with a, a plan to restore the meadow. The other thing Gordon Davis did was create an urban park ranger program. He said, we want to have people out in the park saying, hey, you know, you got to take care of your park. You can't build a bonfire here. <laughs> you, you, you can't roast a pig here. You, can, you, you can't have a monster truck rally in a sheep meadow. <laughs> um, so they hired a bunch of very idealistic young people to be park rangers in the spring of 1980. And that's me in the middle, <coughs> pointing the way. That really is me. I'm pointing the way. I mean, it really is. <laughs> pointing the way to like, I don't know, there's a bathroom over there, but it's closed. <laughs> you can't get in the bathroom. Uh, that's the summer of 1980 when we, the park rangers had just been established. It was like trying to get back to, you know, the parks belong to you all, you have to take care of them. We gave tours to kids and <coughs> worked at special events and stuff like that. And one of the jobs we had was in the fall of 1980, they put beautiful new sod over the sheep meadow. And our job was to protect it and to tell people, sorry, you can't play soccer here anymore, you can't play football, you can't play softball, it's just for Passive recreation. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Literally that. <laughs> and so our job was to gently explain to them, no, sorry, you really can't play here anymore. Here's where you can go play. So, <clears throat> and that's, that was the first sort of really nice place you could have in Central Park where your baby could crawl on the grass and wouldn't eat a needle, probably. Um, or dog poop or whatever the wonderful things that used to be. So we take this for granted now that you can go chill in a sheep meadow, but in the old days you'd be chilling on hard packed dirt and have a football hit you in the head. <laughs> and this was the Harlem Mirror at the north end of the park um, where, you know, it was particularly bad at the north end of the park because they said, you know, it's just Harlem, we don't have to take care of it. <clears throat> and this was the old boathouse there which had been turned briefly into a disco and then the operator set it on fire to collect the insurance. And it, sat there as a burnt out building for like 10 years and the, <coughs> the lake was full of garbage. 
<coughs> this is our right, right, up right by 110th Street, for those of you who know the area. And then it was turned into this. They tore down the old abandoned boathouse. <coughs> they built the learning center and have this beautiful lake up there at the north end, the Harlem end of Central Park. And that was very important to say that everybody deserves a nice park, not just the rich people down on Lower Fifth Avenue, but the people of Harlem too. Uh, Bryant Park, who used to go there to buy drugs? <laughs> I don't see any hands being raised here now. <laughs> So Bryant Park was known in its uh, not so good days, early 1980s, late 70s, as the best place to go buy drugs in Midtown. And also to get killed. There were serious crimes there. People would get murdered. There was drug dealing. And that was um, changed into this through another novel kind of idea, not a conservancy, but the very first use of a business improvement district to encompass a park. So there had been a prior business improvement district, I think, Roger, I think, was the fashion district, was maybe the first business improvement district. And I think all of you know how that works. You know, local businesses pay an extra tax to the city, which turns it over to a nonprofit manager, and they manage the park. The funny thing about Bryant Park, though, is they get a million dollars a year or something from the extra taxes from the surrounding uh, commercial properties, but they spend $7 million a year on the park, $7 million on this one park, because they get to keep the income, the revenue from the restaurants, from the events, and stuff like that. And um, you know, look at that change, extraordinary. <clears throat> and then remember, they, they, 20 years ago, they said, we're gonna put out folding chairs. People said, you're crazy, they'll all get stolen. So that's okay, we'll replace them if they get stolen. They're 25 bucks each. <clears throat> and you know what, they don't get stolen. <clears throat> and the park is a huge success. <clears throat> so the, uh, the creation of the Central Park Conservancy and the Prospect Park Alliance gave rise to about a dozen other conservancies there. And you can see these are not all of them, but some of them. These conservancies now, today, raise between $150 million and $200 million a year in private funds to pay for the restoration and management and the programming of these parks. And some people say, well, hey, that's not fair because it creates a two-tiered park system and the wealthy parks get a lot of money and they're great. <coughs> the poor parks don't and they're terrible. <coughs> I have a differing view, which is the money, the private money that goes into Central Park is money that I, as the Parks Commissioner, didn't have to take from the city's coffers and put it into the park. I could take that money and put it into the parks of Harlem, which I did, or the parks of the South Bronx. <coughs> By the way, not all of those parks are in wealthy neighborhoods. And even in Central Park, there are lots of neighbors to the park who are not wealthy. So this idea that it's only a rich park, only a poor park, there's some credence in it, but it's not entirely true. And that even a park like Bryan Park is used primarily by office workers those aren't wealthy people living in those buildings across the street. In fact, nobody lives across the street. They're all office buildings. <coughs> so it's, it's more, it's a really good thing to have this private money going in because that's $200 million the city didn't have and they can take their money and put it into other parks that don't have wealthy neighbors willing to support them. Here's um, how it sometimes works. There are all different kinds of public-private partnerships. I'm not gonna go into depth in this just to show you that it becomes quite complex, and uh, as Parks Commissioner, I had to negotiate that really delicate ecosystem. But my view was, it's worth the extra work because I'm getting all these people, and the, the most important thing was not the money, it was the fact that if things went downhill for the parks again, which they would or might, there would be all these people worrying about the parks and saying, we're not gonna let them go downhill again. You have a, like a permanent collection of people whose lives are involved inextricably with the lives of the parks. And you never had that before, the conservancies and partnerships. And that even includes things like um, nonprofit partners. Um, there are like 50 little leagues that have legal arrangements to use and maintain little league fields around the city, particularly in places like Staten Island and South Brooklyn. They do all the maintenance, they get the primary use, but they are a nonprofit group helping to make the place nice. The High Line, who, none of you have been to the High Line, right? Is, has anybody not been on the High Line? Raise a hand. So I go around the country a lot, and I talk to people, I'll say, who here has been to Central Park? And like half the people will raise their hands. I'll say, who's been to the High Line? And more than half will raise their hands. It's in some ways one of the number one tourist destinations in New York, but of course this is what it used to look like. Uh, in the old, old days, there were freight trains running through there. <coughs> they were taking meat and other goods back and forth from the, the meat district, meat packing district and the warehouses downtown. And then in 1982, it shut down and stayed shut down. In the late Giuliani administration, it was about to be torn down. And um, the founding,
people who had the idea of turning into Parkestead said, hey, don't do this. They filed a lawsuit. The lawsuit fought just enough time for Mike Bloomberg to come as mayor. He said, I like this idea of the High Line. And he and the Speaker of the City Council, Gifford Miller, put in the first $24 million toward the High Line. And then, of course, <clears throat> you could say the rest is history, um, not just that the, um, the High Line got built. They have spent $250 million building it. It's by far the most expensive park in New York's history. $20 million an acre. That's really expensive. Uh, but the, that investment, and by the way, there's a rumor that that's all private money. It's not. It's mostly public money in that park. It's about $160 million in public money. The rest is private. Um, all those construction cranes around the High Line, 40 new buildings, a economic value of between two and four billion dollars. The taxes, the new taxes collected from the creation of the High Line have way more than amortized the original investment. That wasn't the plan, but that was the effect. Now, that's not going to work for every park, but an extraordinary uh, magnet for economic development. And then my favorite, people say, what was your favorite park you're involved with as Parks Commissioner? And my favorite park was actually Brooklyn Bridge Park because it was such a miracle. This is not a photograph. It's more of a rendering of what the park kind of looks like now, but this is what we said it would look like 20 years ago. And largely speaking, it is that now. To me, it's, it's a, an utter miracle. It took a lot of great civic leadership. And I'm going to do something unusual here. I'm going to say it actually started not under Mayor Bloomberg or the governor then. It actually started under Mayor Giuliani and under Governor Pataki, who made this agreement to give away this really, really valuable state-owned land, the, the former dockyards there, and not sell it to a developer and invest hundreds of millions of dollars in public money. That was a really bold thing to do, and they did it, um, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. We in the Bloomberg administration carried it forward. We had to put more money into it, but it started under a Republican mayor and Republican governor. I miss the days when there were Republicans who were leaders in the environmental movement, and Pataki was the last one we had like that. He was a great, great mayor for the environment. He came for every opening of every park in New York City. He loved parks. He was a great partner to, to our work. Miss Governor Pataki. Um, and and it's, it's the stuff you don't see about Brooklyn Bridge Park is what fascinates me. So, you know, it was built on old docks, totally flat areas, landfill, and there, but there's hills. So where do those hills come from? Those hills come from when they were digging the, the new tunnel going to Grand Central under the East River. There's a lot of rock left over. See that, those piles of rock coming out there? That rock from that digger went to make these hills. So everything in the park is basically recycled. So there's a lot of stone from under the river, and then the steps are made out of um, former uh, pieces of a bridge, and the wood comes from the old um, cold warehouse, cold storage warehouse. So it's a totally recycled park. And it's not just a recycled park, but it's designed to recycle everything. There's a full cycle of water recycling. So when the rainwater falls, I mean, it goes into um, all kinds of drainage structures for to collect for irrigation and for other things. And if, if you've been to Brooklyn Ridge Park, you've seen that beautiful wetland in one section. That's totally artificial, a totally human-created wetland fed by stormwater runoff collected in that very elaborate design by Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. So uh, this model of conservancies has been covered, copied not just in New York City, but across the country. Some of the major parks in, in Pittsburgh are now run by the Pittsburgh Park Conservancy. Um, the Piedmont Park Conservancy restored the, the Central Park of Atlanta. It's a spectacular park. And these are some pictures. I often show pictures. The before pictures were kind of like the before pictures of the Central Park. But um, you know, a remarkable restoration of a spectacular park in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is going on in city after city across the country. This I'm putting up there, you'll, you'll all say, I have no idea what this is. What is this thing? This is kind of a, a vision project. It's not my project. It's not our project but I just like it. It's an idea of putting a park and a deck over the sunken BQE in Southside Williamsburg. And there you can see the current conditions and all those bridges that cross the BQE um, are 50 or 60 years old now, maybe older, maybe 70, so they, they need to be replaced. So one idea is instead of replacing individual bridges, just build a park. Build a park and a deck across the highway and you create a new park of entity for a park, that, a neighborhood that has very few parks. Um, 
You say, well, that's crazy. Who would want to do that? They just did it in Dallas. Dallas built Clyde Warren Park across an eight-lane freeway in the middle of downtown Dallas. And so if they could do it in Dallas, they can do it here. And in fact, there are a number of freeways that were covered over with parks, including the Big Dig Project in Boston. And many decades ago, the creation of Freeway Park in Seattle, which they built a park on a deck over the freeway that goes through downtown Seattle. So this is a project I'd love to see happen. Again, the Trust for Public Land is not working on it, but if I were picking like one or two dream projects, I would pick this project. <coughs> but also um, do more of these. So the Trust for Public Land has now done 201 transformations of schoolyards into playgrounds across New York. <coughs> so this is a, a really cheap, fast way to create additional public space as New York City continues to grow. And then this is the other dream project. Um, we call this the Queensway. Imagine, if you will, an abandoned rail line running from Rigo Park all the way down to, um, to Jamaica Bay. It used to cross Jamaica Bay and go to Rockaway. It was called the Rockaway Beach Branch of the Long Island Railroad. And so people would get on a train in Rockaway Beach, far Rockaway, and they go across and then connect up in Rigo Park to a line going in into uh, Penn Station. They shut it down in 1962 because of lack of ridership. They couldn't afford to keep it open. So now you have that picture at the top, which is these abandoned railroad tracks running three and a half miles. They replaced it, by the way, with the A train coming across Jamaica Bay and then cutting over. You can see where it comes over here. <coughs> but this, this three and a half mile stretch, almost 50 acres, has been abandoned since 1962. And there are trees growing up through it, as you can see. And the Trust for Public Land is working with the Friends of the Queensway, and we've developed a master plan for turning this into a three and a half mile linear park and greenway. And it's wide enough so you can have a bike path and a pedestrian walking path. So it's wider and bigger than the High Line. So it's seven times the acreage, and we could do it for about half the cost. So if I leave you with one thought, it's let's build the Queensway. And I call it the People's High Line because this, as you know, Working class neighborhoods of Ozone Park, uh, working middle class Ozone Park, Woodhaven, Richmond Hill, highly diverse, a lot of South Asians living there. And you look at the interest of thing. What do you not see if you look at Richmond Hill, Woodhaven, and Ozone Park, that whole neighborhood? What do you not see there? Green. There are no parks. So Ozone Park, named for park, has no parks. So this would create not just a linear park going into Ozone Park, but a way to get up to Forest Park, which is like the central park of Central Queens, and you have to drive there now. You have to drive there on the most dangerous road in all of New York City, Woodhaven Boulevard, where every year about 10 people die trying to cross that street. So um, this is a great project. I will say gently, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I will leave you with this. Uh, New York City was once a, a terribly um, dilapidated, dark, and graffiti-covered, and dirty city. And the extraordinary things that have happened in the last four decades have transformed it into a very a wonderful place to live. I took this picture last summer on Pier 6 in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And just think about that. You're sitting in a field of yellow flowers looking at downtown Manhattan. I'll leave you with that. <laughs>